and I'm really excited uh, for our next talk. Um, we will be welcoming to the stage NLP engineer from Georgetown University. Welcome, James. Um, he is here to talk with us about lessons from a year with Snorkel, data-centric data -centric workflows with SMEs at Georgetown. Welcome. Thanks so much for the introduction. And uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I'm at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, which is a research institute at Georgetown University. We focus on AI, cybersecurity, and biotech. So by way of background for this talk, our work is driven by collaboration between two teams. We have analysts who are subject matter experts, and then we have a team of data scientists and engineers and other technical specialists. That second team where I sit develops pipelines for analysis. And most often I work on classification and information extraction problems with scientific text. So today I'm going to share with you what we've learned from applying Snorkel to these kinds of problems over the past year. So how did we get here? We had two high level goals with adoption of Snorkel. And the first of these goals was lowering the barriers to developing models. For us, large-scale annotation was expensive, and this made projects that needed it risky. Basically, some problems would only be solvable with a lot of labels to train on. And then other problems wouldn't be solvable, at least as you've defined them, even with all of those labels. And you can invest a lot to figure out which is which. That's what I mean by project risk. So large-scale annotation was expensive and slow. We were interested in efficiency and productivity gains. Our second goal was to improve collaboration between domain experts and data scientists. We believed that Exposing data more directly and continuously to subject matter experts and the broader product team. During a project, doing that would empower them to inform and improve our solutions, that this would deliver better results. We saw Snorkel Flow as a replacement for ad hoc spreadsheet tooling. And it looked faster and easier to push out batches of examples to team members in platform. So this is a, a preview of how it went for us. We started out with a pilot project, which I'll show you later. We delivered six products across a couple of product types or problem types rather. We onboarded four product teams and we got very good feedback from subject matter experts in particular. From users in technical roles, the experience was net positive, and I'll say more on that later. In two projects, we would have needed to invest in large-scale external annotation efforts without Snorkel. And free of that, we were able to deliver those products faster. We also took on two projects that were more speculative because programmatic labeling let us avoid those big startup costs. And finally, we did make improvements to product development workflows. So before adoption, we considered where in the project workflow we spent most of our time and where we tended to encounter friction. For supervised learning, our workflow was pretty linear, starting with problem definition. Because labeling was so time consuming, we only did it when we really had to. Before we started labeling data ourselves, we'd ask whether a problem could be reformulated to avoid it. And if we really did need an annotation effort, we couldn't have our domain experts labeling tens of thousands of examples. So. To scale up annotation, we'd write down 
how domain experts knew what label to apply in the form of annotation guidelines. And this is an excerpt from an old one, just a paragraph. But the full guidelines here would be 20 plus pages. They had to motivate and explain the task, give examples like you see here. Developing effective annotation guidelines is difficult, really because as a domain expert, the decision rules that you apply during labeling draw on a lot of, of implicit knowledge, which then has to be made explicit for annotators. And unsurprisingly, this is not easy uh, for anyone. So when the guidelines were tested and ready, we'd scale up annotation with, with crowdsourcing, with outsourcing, and this could easily take months. There's a risk that during this process, you discover the annotation guidelines were not perfect, but at that point, changing them can mean annotators redoing work. When the label data starts coming back, we have to evaluate it. It's a challenge to get high quality labels from annotation at scale. So there's, of course, research on evaluating annotators, on distributing work to them effectively, and then assessing the labels you get back. This is important, whoever is creating them naturally. So the bottom line is that the labeling stage is absolutely critical, but it's slow and it's expensive. And in the end, you may not get back what you need. It's only after acquiring labels that we're finally ready for model development under supervision. So if you're a data scientist, this is the point where you receive label data and you try to develop a model. We might be six months or more now from project start. And after all of that labeling work, we really hope that it's possible to train a performant model from this data. You don't want to discover that even with all the new labels, the problem as you defined it originally is not tractable. But of course, in practice, this happens. So this is our new workflow. We still start with problem formulation, naturally. Not much changes there. But labeling is very different. We kick off with small scale annotation, and that informs the development of programmatic labels. Then we're programmatically creating labeled data for training our classifier. And this means that we can revise the labels instantaneously. In practice, we, we often do this. Under the traditional workflow, we get one shot at problem definition then we move on to high cost labeling and essentially we cross our fingers. We found that in the process of small scale exploratory creation of ground truth labels and this, this initial development of labeling functions, we often gain a better understanding of the data than we had at the outset and we re revise uh, our approach. There are similar changes to model development. So we're running quick experiments. Do the classes seem learnable as we've defined them? And if not, let's revise. So there's more iteration here over these three phases. To recap what changed for us, we still begin with problem formulation. What's different? is that we encoded subject matter expertise as previously annotation guidelines with snorkel as labeling functions, heuristics defined in code. Previously, we scaled up annotation using more people, essentially. Now, again, with code. And to be clear, in both workflows, we do the final evaluation against ground truth from subject matter experts. 
So our pilot project with Snorkel was identifying a particular subset of virology research. And we wanted to surface publications that described gain of function research. We operationalized this as experimental work that changed certain phenotypic characteristics of viruses. So if a lab experiment makes H5N1 airborne transmissible, as this paper describes, that's an example of gain of function research. I started out here by applying the open source snorkel library, and then we moved to snorkel flow. I was working with PubMed central data in collaboration with two bio PhDs. And we started with a lit review and that small scale labeling that I described earlier. This supported the development of labeling functions. And you can see here highlighted some of the patterns that we found predictive of relevant papers. Viruses acquire abilities. They become more transmissible, more virulent, more resistant. We identified methods that were associated with gain of function research, like serial passage, and patterns like genetically modified virus. Here's a capture from the snorkel flow UI for evaluating labeling functions. The highlighted labeling function here is keyword based. It looks for mentions of serial passage and when it finds them, it, it votes relevant. We have some ground truth in the data at this point from small scale annotation. And we can see that this is a high precision labeling function with 88% precision against ground truth, but most papers don't mention serial passage, so it covers 5% of the data. We found through exploration of the data that abstracts referring to sensitivity were usually non-relevant. They were referring to sensitivity in the context of test kit development, like the sensitivity of an antigen test for a virus. And this turned out to be a high precision negative polarity labeling function when we evaluated it against ground truth. Now, at the outset of this project, we weren't thinking much about this adjacent test kit and vaccine development research. But in this workflow, we surfaced these publications and we put them in front of our domain experts for review in a way that informed the final product. So to summarize, we set out to find publications describing gain of function research in PubMed Central. This was a pilot application of a more iterative workflow that brought domain experts closer to the data in collaboration with the technical lead. And we were able to avoid large scale external annotation in favor of programmatic labeling. Our pipeline used PubMed BERT trained on publication text and weak labels. And those weak labels were based on heuristics like the ones that we just saw, along with some other signals of relevance. The second project that I'd like to share with you briefly was developing a pipeline to identify AI safety research for further analysis. We're looking here at part of the product. It's a dashboard which shows the geographic distribution of researcher output in this literature. This is another component. Here we're looking at growth in the broader AI literature at the top and the subfield of AI safety at the bottom between 2016 and 2021. So with that as context, this project moved quickly from formulation to product release. One of the factors there was that the domain expert and the data scientist role were occupied by the same person because of the domain. We were also able to train a simple and performant model in platform, which saved us time. We then deployed the resulting pipeline using MLflow on GCP and uh, released it on eto.tech. 
So I said at the top that the experience for users of snorkel flow in technical roles was net positive, but they did also encounter friction points. So we found that the learning curve could be steeper for them than for subject matter experts who were doing small scale labeling and data exploration. The people in technical roles had to adapt to a new paradigm for model development. They were also in a position to encounter issues when they were loading our data into snorkel flow or setting up projects, later on deploying pipelines in our environment. On balance, they also got productivity gains and workflow improvements. For subject matter experts, it was all upside. They had a better UX for labeling and more visibility into the status of projects. And we were also able to deliver products faster, which was always well received. For our team, we found that the workflow that we've settled into with Snorkel is more collaborative, it's more iterative, and it's lower risk. So the core elements of this to review, we first have small scale annotation, and this is usually by subject matter experts. Then we're encoding domain knowledge in labeling functions for programmatic labeling, either by more technical subject matter experts or by data scientists. Then we have classifier development, and of course, finally, evaluation. There's a lot of room for adjustment here during um, iteration over these stages. The third and the last takeaway that I'd like to emphasize is that for us, Snorkel addressed in particular the challenge of creating training data. And it does this by replacing large scale human annotation with programmatic annotation. The availability of training data is probably the most significant bottleneck in supervised learning projects, but it's certainly not the, old, the, the only one. And hard problems are going to remain hard. So problem formulation is still critical, even when you can revisit it. And if you create poorly defined classes and try to learn them, there's nothing about weak supervision that'll save you from yourself. So during project planning, post-adoption, the question will come up, should we use Snorkel for, for this or that? And what I found this turns on is whether the crux of the problem we need to solve is the creation of labeled data. That specifically is the problem that we've addressed most successfully with Snorkel. So thank you for listening, and I'd love to take any questions. Thank you so much, James. Uh, that was great to hear how you've used Snorkel Flow um, to really make a difference, both for your um, data scientists as well as subject matter experts. We do have some questions here. Um, to dive right in, the first question we'll take is, you mentioned that one of your goals with Snorkel was to expose the data more directly to your subject matter experts. Um, can you say a little bit more about what you mean by this and the impact that it had to expose that data? Yeah, thanks. So previously, as I talked through, we had a sort of one shot and linear workflow. So subject matter experts and data scientists would sit down together at the beginning of the project. We would look at some at a small sample of data points and we develop those annotation guidelines. Once we adopted Snorkel, we were doing that throughout the course of the project as we developed labeling functions, as we, as we moved into model development, and then as we iterated over these, these three stages. And so we were able to change, in some cases, the formulation of the problem based on new kinds of data that we were seeing that we weren't entirely aware of like that were that were being surfaced through the label function development and model development. So an example of that was in the gain of function research project, 
we ended up finding all of this research that was about test kit development and loss of function um, in the context of, of vaccine development research. And so this ended up um, getting kind of pulled into the frame for the analysis that we did um, based on the final pipeline. It's cool. That's cool that you're able to develop this whole different almost category of data that was that was within your data. Um, you mentioned how you used these uh, data or these annotation guidelines um, before transitioning to snorkel flow. When you were using snorkel flow, did you ever have to write up these annotation guidelines? What was what was their role um, in a world with snorkel flow? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. I I suppose in some sense they still exist, but I think that the the burden on them is much lighter. I mean, we still document the choices that we're making about uh, class boundaries and sort of inclusion or exclusion criteria, but we no longer need to somehow try to take all of the, the knowledge that's in a subject matter expert's head and you know, it, encoded in these, in these documents for a non-expert to apply during annotation. So we can um, rely a bit more on, I guess, I guess, the shared knowledge that we have on the product team, which really, I guess, relieves a bit of, a bit of pressure on, um, on, on the role of that document. That's nice to have a little less pressure there. Um, you mentioned that the reaction from SMEs was very, very positive. Um, but it seems like with this new workflow, they're still spending a lot of time annotating. Did you get any pushback from there on, on this annotation workflow that they were in? I guess maybe that's a little bit surprising that we did not. Um, I think that at the end of the day, what um, those stakeholders in projects were really motivated uh, by was getting to a finished product, like a deployable pipeline that could be used in analysis as quickly as possible. And so we were presenting them with an alternative workflow in which um, they would be more engaged throughout this model development process. Um, and the whole process would be a lot shorter. So it did require um, this investment of this, this investment of time for this collaboration between domain experts on the one hand and data scientists on the other hand. Um, but it got us to a, a successfully trained model, a, a working pipeline a lot faster. And I think that was a good trade for them. That is exciting. Um, you mentioned a little bit about problem formulation and how it's it's quite difficult. Um, and even once you start development, sometimes there's changes and you have to go back to the problem formulation, um, kind of how you, you initially were linear and then started to get to be a little bit more iterative. Um, and the data centric development really helps in those solution, in those situations. But do you have any ideas on how data centric development could help with the problem formulation um, itself? I suppose I've started to think of it as a more, like a more protracted process than I used to. I mean, we've, we're now able to uh, sketch out where we're headed and then start a sort of exploratory like data analysis and label function development like uh, effort that like can sort of give us a sense of what viable approaches to a, a problem there there might be. I guess that um, before it was sort of make your best guess at how to solve a problem um, and, and hope you're right. And I mean, when we're working now uh, with programmatic labeling, I, 
I guess that there's just more flexibility to like have a hypothesis and then move into like label function development. You'll start seeing more of the data and getting a better sense of what solutions are are likely to work and and what might not. Um, maybe you've sort of thought about the 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 class base wrong or something, and like you you discover that the data looks a bit differently than you expected. And so like it's it's not too late. You know, you can go back and and you can revise um, how you're thinking about the problem. I think that's powerful. Yeah, it's it's very helpful to be able to go back and revise. <laughs> I know it's hard when you have to guess out of the out of the gate. Um, so I noticed there were a lot of LFs um, that you worked with on this project. Um, how easy or hard was it to come up with LFs, especially in high numbers, 100, 200? Mm. I guess that we relied a lot. Um, we, we started out with, after this initial lit review, say, on the gain of function research project, we started out with um, uh, what the subject matter experts anticipated would be like effective keyword searches. And we moved from there as we started um, labeling examples, like at a small scale, we moved from there to um, the generated labeling functions that were suggested by the platform. Um, those and the cluster labeling functions allowed us to, yeah, allowed us to like scale up the number of labeling functions that we were using like a lot faster than if we had to sit down and come up with them ourselves. Yeah, those auto-generated auto are very helpful. Um, for your specific use case, what would you say the distribution was between time spent on data development versus model development? Hmm. I mean, I think we spent a lot more time on data development than we did on, on model development, really. Um, I think that uh, that's really the, the hardest part. And it's where we ended up investing most of our time. I mean, I think in a sense that's that's sort of always been true for us also. It's not really a change because previously we had large scale annotation and that was kind of this block in the middle of the project between problem formulation and then model development. We had to develop this training data, um, create these ground truth labels uh, with, with an annotation team. And so we'd essentially just, just wait until they were done, evaluate the labels as they came in. That was really the most time consuming part of the whole, the whole project uh, uh, like life cycle. And so we are now, I think still um, spending like more time there than in any other phases of the project but we are delivering a lot faster. So at the end of the day, um, it's it's less time than if we were waiting on annotation teams. That's good. Good to hear. We like when it gets faster. Okay, we are out of time, but thank you so much for being here today and answering all of those questions. Um, I know I personally love seeing all the work that um, you guys have done uh, at CSET. Thanks so much.